somewhere on Earth is headed for New Mexico, the fifth largest state of the USA. With barely 1% of the population, it is one of the country's most sparsely populated regions. Situated between Texas and Arizona, New Mexico is a wide open land of desert and mountain. Sarah grew up in Taos on the banks of the legendary Rio Grande. She is a devoted fan of this river, where she spends most of her time on her favorite activity, whitewater kayaking. She lives the free and simple existence of those who have found their way in life. James lives on the cusp of speed, risk, and fear. Tearing along at over 80 kilometers an hour, he's in search of the perfect balance between adrenaline and harmony. For him, skateboarding is more than an extreme sport. It is an art in itself. 10 years ago, Christy returned here to the ancestral Apache lands in the southern part of the state in search of her identity. Now she is undertaking a pilgrimage to the heart of the Indian world, and thus retracing her own history. You know, you can look here and say, bugs, dirt, dry, or you can look here and say, wow, vast, open, wild. <clears throat> so I think there, you have to have something inside of you that's going to respond as well. And I think that's why the story of being a Native American descendant is so important, is having that blood allows that response. Southern New Mexico was Apache territory. Christy Moya and Joe Science are Native American descendants. Their ancestors belong to the Chiricahua tribe. Roaming this vast, wild region together has been a way for Christy and Joe to commune with the spirit of the Apache people that continues to haunt these mountains. The Apache culture in New Mexico was nearly wiped out during the conquest of the West. Now the Indians live on reservations. But for Christy and Joe, their freedom is too precious for them to live on the lands handed back by the U.S. government. About 10 years ago, Christy happened to find out that she is a mestiza, a mixed blood descendant of Spanish and Apache origin. This discovery changed her life. My mother died when I was two, and my descendancy comes from my maternal line. And my father hid her, her story and also hid the fact that um, I still had family on my mother's side. I had three aunts and a grandmother and a grandfather, and until he died, I had no idea. One day, I got a phone call from my brother about saying, uh, Christy, are you sitting down? Um, I got, we've gotten a call from a radio program that says that our Auntie Connie has found us. She came on the radio and introduced herself. And it was um, a little bit difficult to go through that <laughs> national radio. Um, 
so they picked us all up by limousine and helicopters and brought us all to San Francisco and we had a big family reunion and it was um, very moving. Before she learned of her family history and rediscovered her Native American roots, Christy was a graphic designer. She led a comfortable life by the Pacific Ocean in Northern California, where she raised her two daughters. Then she decided to turn over a new leaf and follow her instinct. She came to settle on these vast, wide open spaces to live out her Apache identity that had been hidden from her for so long. Now, little by little, Christy is picking up the threads of her long buried heritage. Um, it is not unusual for uh, Native American descendants to not know they descend from Native blood. And a lot of that has to do with shame um, in that, you know, it was still in the 1940s where there were signs on public buildings no Indians, no dogs. At the Padilla Ranch, Joe is getting the horses ready for his trip with Christy. They're about to undertake a pilgrimage to the heart of the ancestral Apache land. We can make a, it's like a southwestern sandwich. So when you're on the trail, all you have to do is eat it. That was, uh, Always one of the complaints of the military when they started chasing Apaches in here was just uh, how rough the country was. But uh, Apaches were used to it. They dealt with it. They accommodated for it because we believe that this country was made specifically for us. Back in California, 1,500 kilometers away, one of Christie's daughters is about to give birth to a little Apache girl. So Christie is about to become a grandmother. She wants to celebrate the event at Warm Spring, a traditional site sacred for all Apaches. There's only one trail that leads there. Joe and Christie will have to do a four-hour drive across the desert, then two days on horseback. I'm used to feeling everything, how it feels on the horse and the, the saddle, so if I have to saddle in the dark, I can do it. You never know in the wilderness. Half a horse? No, not really, but uh, I, uh, I have a good idea of what's good for them and what they may need, because uh, I like what I do, so I have to try to keep my horses in good shape and. Yes, he's half a horse. <laughs> you are. Our wild Indian ponies, they were part of us. Like you were talking with Joe, is he part Indian? Is he part horse? Are they part Indian? <laughs> Maybe so. It's not often we get to um, 
have an experience where the ground itself, the water, the mountains, everything can just feel a part of your body. It isn't even about, you know, owning or controlling or, you know, fencing. It's just the fact that uh, this wild terroir, this wild land, this wild soil has the bones of our ancestors. Joe is, in Apache family style, my brother. And so what he did was what he does best, and that is he showed me Apache culture and history through land. And so we traveled, I think it was about two years together off and on, throughout Apache territory, which is southern, our territory, which is southern New Mexico, all the way down to Chihuahua City in Mexico, along the, the mountains back up. And so I've seen, you know, everything where we, used to where we used to roam and we used to live. Joe's family, proud of its heritage, gave him a very traditional upbringing. His Indian name is Mbatsu, the wolf. He has become Christie's best friend. Together, they are traveling back in time through their common heritage, back to the origin of their now vanished world. Growing up, my family uh, taught us about the idea of being a person in nature not to use tools, not to use vehicles and cars and trucks and things everywhere. There's places that should be left just like they are. We should not leave trash, we should not leave things behind. If anything, only our footprints and our, and our hoof prints. All our ancestors and all our elders have always told us to protect what we have, that uh, it is our duty and our responsibility to do that. Nothing like the wilderness. Quiet, vast. We're just a little tiny piece of the great big picture. This is our land. It's in my bones, it's in my blood. It's Apache land. These arid lands of New Mexico seem to jealously guard their secrets. And yet they say that the mother of all Apaches was born from the clear water of a spring. 
This evening, Christy and Joe are only a few hours away from that sacred stream. It's like this in the morning when you know the, the day is starting out. It's, it's a good time to pray. It's the day is changing. It's that um, that change that I like. Last night was uh, was nice. It, always with the coyotes uh, singing. It's nice to know that animals around. So. If you see tracks, if you hear them, the birds singing, uh, that's, um, that's why I'm out here. Wait, did you hear rustling last night? I, think, I thought I heard something really early this morning, but it didn't sound big. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a bear in your belly. Yeah, it's a hungry bear, uh -huh. but I gotta fight it. Warm spring, the Apache's sacred source, flows from the base of these hills. Joe knows the spot very well and comes here often to commune with the spirits of his people. This is the mythical wellspring that is at the heart of Apache spirituality. The spring is uh, known as a, a sacred site to Apaches, especially the Chiricahuas. Uh, we believe that the, the Chiricahuas, this is one of the places where they merged onto the earth when we were created and put upon this earth to live here. Yusen, Oka, Ay Hanataje. Hayago, Onait Hayu, Hadag, Hayago, Onait Hayu, Hadag, Oka, Ay Hanadaje, Hayago, Onait Hayu. Apache people are spiritual people by nature. Uh, everything that we do involves prayer, involves acknowledging the, the elements, the, the air, the water, the land. And so whenever we go somewhere that's special, uh, we want to approach it in the proper way. And one of those ways is to pray and offer prayers to the place that we're at. And, uh, you know, that's, that's always something that is, is done by Apache people, and especially in a, in a place like this. Today, a new life in my family came into being. And my uh, youngest, newest granddaughter was born early this morning. And um, she's an extension of this place. She's another Apache descendant. And I intend to make sure she knows that <laughs> and to bring her here. You know, let her, pl let her play in the water as a baby. and and tell her the stories as she grows up, so she knows where she came from. And so she always feels like she has a home. Perhaps someday in the future, 
a woman of Apache descent will also make the pilgrimage to this sacred spring. She will recall that long ago, her grandmother, who led an exceptional life, came to chant here on the day she was born. a fascination both on nature lovers and thrill seekers. It seems like this legendary river attracts free spirits, sports freaks, and oddballs from all over the country. They've been waiting months for this moment, the autumn rains that poured down on the Colorado mountains and the New Mexican mesas have at last swollen the waters of the Rio Grande. Today, the river has the fury of a mountain torrent. This little community of kayakers can kick off the season. The region around Taos in the northern part of the state is a paradise for them. This is where Sarah Van Gilder Rain lives. Aaron is Sarah's husband. It was kayaking that brought them together several years ago. Ever since, they've shared the same passion for extreme sports and a special affection for the Rio Grande. So this is it, Sarah. Yeah, okay. It's right here. We're gonna just take the boats one at a time. We're gonna lower them off right here, and then we'll have both our boats below the first cliff. Sounds good. Okay. Yep. Super. Let's do it. Super duper. It's a little bit tricky, but sometimes access is difficult. <laughs> sometimes you have to walk out because the water's too high or too low, or there's a log or it's dark. <laughs> so sometimes we have to walk out of the cliffs of the gorges. Today we're walking in. <laughs> When access is difficult, there's going to be no one there. Um, a lot of times, the access is the adventure. Yeah, tough to get down to the river today. It's a steep, slippery basalt rock and a long descent. But the reality is we save a lot of flat water, and we get to just run the rapid parts of the river today. So are we going down there or what? It appears to look easy a lot of times. People often think that they can do something because it, we make it look so easy. 
which is great because I like to be inspirational and I want to be inspirational. So to be able to inspire people to have that chance to go into a kayak and p to to experience some passageway. But often people think that it's a lot easier than it really is. Whitewater kayaking is a dangerous sport. The river has its quirks, and it's best to check out the tricky spots beforehand, like a rally driver. It's, it's kind of an, a kayak saying that when you scout, the time that you look at the scary part is the time that you're going to be in the scary part. Getting worked, they say. I don't want to get worked. <laughs> Anna, Aaron and Sarah's 10-year-old daughter, has been swimming in the Rio Grande since she was a baby. This little tribe earns its living thanks to their enthusiasm for kayaking. Sarah is an instructor, and once a year when the river here is too low, the family takes off to Patagonia for six months during the summer in the Southern Hemisphere, where they train young Chilean kayakers. before and she still hadn't arrived and so I went into a kayak and we were paddling around with very good friends all around and Hannah decided to announce her arrival and went into labor here. And now my daughter's here <laughs> getting to practice the same. It's a pretty special, special day. is a lot like a being. It has, it has so much personality. It fluctuates. It's loud. It's quiet. It gets very high. It gets very low. It, it's, a, it's like a living being. And it's so big because it's all around the world. There's rivers everywhere. And it gives you a good purpose in life to be able to explore rivers of the world. Sarah goes to meet her friend Chris at the first light of dawn. He's a ULM pilot, and this morning they're going to treat themselves to a bird's eye view of the canyons of the Rio Grande. The region around Taos acts like a magnet on lovers of wide open spaces. The hardy souls who have settled here are in contact with nature all year round. Not only is it a favorite spot for kayaking, it's also one of the best places in the country for skiing.
Last year, I had a dream where I flew out to the gorge. I was hovering over the gorge and I turned back around and I flew back and it was sunrise. And so I told Chris, I specifically called him and said, Chris, I had this dream because I saw him the following day flying up over the gorge and I realized that he was living my dream, literally. People who know the river well agree that the stretch near Taos is the most spectacular. Dozens of westerns have been shot in this majestic landscape. The Rio Grande has become an archetype, familiar to all Americans. It's over 3,000 kilometers long, and its lower part forms a natural boundary between the United States and Mexico. It's so quiet up there too. Just the way that the ULM flies, it's just, it's very peaceful. You go up there, the air's warmer actually, and you get up there and it's very tranquilo, tranquil, wonderful. It's majestic. Taos, land of enchantment. For millions of years, the canyons of the Rio Grande have been the battlegrounds of a relentless combat between water and stone. Sarah has found her equilibrium in this struggle and the power of the water. Before each descent, she prepares to give her all to become one with the river. This is her way of living in harmony with a raw, tumultuous realm forever in movement. This is the moment of truth. Sarah takes the plunge and on her own braves the whims of the Rio Grande. The beauty of kayaking is that there's wave trains. Life is a wave train. There's, there's peaks, there's valleys, there's... Sometimes you see the end and sometimes you don't. And sometimes you get scared and sometimes it, um, it, it builds your confidence. And you never know what's around the corner. Even on rivers that you've been on because the river changes. nature surrounding me and me in my kayak. I love the idea of floating on top of the water because I know there's a world below me and a world above me and I'm right on that edge. I'm right on that line. For me, I go down the river and it removes all the problems of everything. And it makes me realize that the small things, the big things, nothing really matters a whole lot. You just have to be able to take it for what it is.
James West is from another planet. Riding his skateboard, he's playing with existence, flirting with the curves, and day after day he traces arabesques on the roads of New Mexico. This is no longer a sport for him, but more a wink to the plodding earthlings. On his board, James has attained the pitch-perfect balance of an equilibrist or trapeze artist. Longboarding is really great because it's given me an opportunity to really connect with nature. They both go together really well because a lot of the roads we want to skate, the fast, big, technical roads, are all roads going up to the top of mountain peaks. James is right at home on these mountain roads that snake down to the vast plains. He dreams of a road, an endless road, that would carry him to the ends of the earth. He slips along the ribbon of asphalt and for a moment transforms it into an invisible fleeting work of art. You're just on that fine line of uh, the wheels gripping and the wheels sliding. And you just keep them gripping for just a moment. And right when they feel like they're going to slide, you let them just a little bit and then bounce back off of them. And it's an amazing feeling. That's where the art part of skateboarding comes in. At a certain point, you don't want to skate a small hill. You want to skate a big, giant, fast mountain with crazy 180 degree turns and sharp corners and really high speeds. And at the same time, these mountain roads uh, don't have many people on them and they're absolutely beautiful. James lives in Albuquerque New Mexico's largest city. Once a year, thousands of flying enthusiasts converge here from all over the planet. Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta is the largest gathering of hot air balloons in the world. Every morning, 500 balloons light up the sky of New Mexico, and 3,000 eager beavers are busy on the ground. One of them is James, the dreamer. Everyone in Albuquerque, in all of New Mexico, knows about the Balloon Fiesta. It's a, it's a fun event to uh, go to. Um, and sometimes we'll show up in the morning and uh, we'll help uh, some of the balloonists down. And it's always a really fun experience. You always meet some really <laughs> funny and interesting people. Yeah, it's, I'm very proud of my little city. <laughs> If there were a road from heaven down to Albuquerque, James would be the first to barrel down it at top speed. He could have been a tightrope walker, but he chose to push his limits in the purity of speed. His quest for freedom is a far cry from the constraints imposed by a sport. Longboarding is simply an extension of his being.
I could consider it an art. Sometimes it'll look like dancing. Someone's just coming down the hill with so much style that it looks like he's dancing. And then it's, it's an art for sure because uh, it's, it's hard. And it also takes style to be good. Hidden away in the mountains of New Mexico are some very tempting roads. James searches them out and breathes new meaning into them. In his world, these roads are not exclusively for cars. Extreme skateboarding is barely tolerated in the United States. James is an asphalt maverick and in the eyes of the local sheriffs, an outlaw. Whenever you're at your usual hills, you know how to skate them, and after a while, it becomes second nature. And it's, it may not be as fun to skate after that. Um, and then you come to a new hill, and <laughs> it scares you again. You get a big rush of adrenaline. And I like new roads. James has recently spotted a mountain pass at an elevation of 2,000 meters in the north of the Chihuahua Desert. Yeah, the turn over there is actually, it's pretty mellow. It looks really sharp. It's 180 degrees, but um, if you carve off a little bit of speed, it's not all that fast. It looks fast. I think that's one of the harder corners is that it's a left-right, too. It's a real oh, right. steep chicane. It's two 90s right on top of each other. Right. The king of sports in Albuquerque is the rodeo, an art just as risky as that of James. He has been familiar with horses and corrals ever since his childhood, but he has never yet dared take on a bull. Yeah, um, so you can just uh, stand up there right and just kind of put your, your arm like this in case the, the bull's back inside the chute. You can just like hold me. Hold you, yeah. yeah. Keep you from yeah, you Today, the skateboarder is with his friend Jonathan, a young Mexican who's training for an upcoming rodeo. <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> that was that was messed up. That's scary. I was holding you all right. Yeah. Yes. All right. Kinda too explosive, you know, like too high. Like I was trying to to stay as much as I could, but it's just practice. So it's better like trying to not get hurt and be be healthy for the next rodeo. Bull riding as a whole has become a lot more uh, an extreme sport. So you're getting a lot of people that are involved that that are kind of like skateboarders, those type of things that like 
extreme sports. Um, there's still a few of us that, that are, it's our roots, you know. We, we were raised this way. We were raised around cattle and horses and, and this way of life forever. And it's one of them deals, once it gets in your blood, it's kind of one of the things you, you stick to. We definitely don't make much money at it, but, but we like doing it, you know. No, thank you. <laughs> Same deal like before, like I said, just keep moving towards the front, okay? They're getting you a little bit tipped to the side and you're kind of just clamping. Let loose and get a hold with your feet. Keep chasing your rope, okay? Put those spurs, get a hold with them. Squeeze tight and keep moving to the front, all right? Okay, try good, Kagan, you'll do good. Keep moving. Right, good. So when he kicks like it, shove your hips into him, right? Then when he comes up, then push. And then shove your hips back into him, okay? You did good. You didn't quit, as long as you try. I'm gonna try a little one, just for fun. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Kind of curious, honestly. I guess I should take my phone out of my pocket. Uh, look out horns and stuff. <laughs> What's uh, his name? Chaos. Chaos, great. <laughs> Big guy like that. <laughs> Fuck. What do I wish for in my life? Um I I don't really want a whole lot out of life. I I just want to I want to live in a cabin in the woods next to a huge mountain road and I just want to skate until I can't skate anymore and um, you know I always want to be learning at the same time but really I just I just want to be following my passion for the rest of my life and be able to pursue that and live comfortably. <laughs> That's all I want. James, a blacktop acrobat, has found his inner stability on his board. He is a daring dreamer, a young free spirit. He's living life in the fast lane as he tears down the mountains. His soul is inhabited by the folly and happiness of those whose only need is their passion, a passion that fills an entire life. James, at 24, is destined to become a longboard legend. He is one of the best at this new discipline. Endlessly, his life and the road unroll at top speed before his board. <laughs> <laughs> 